Hi, I'm Kevin. And I'm Amanda. And we are serving up all that jam. A lighthearted look at the weekend jam bands. Where we break down the jam scene's biggest stories, talk new bands, upcoming tours, and show reviews. A little laughing, some hot takes, and an always positive message for the community. Sam Rinchetti, manager, Kendall Street Company. Sam, thank you for joining us today. Um, we actually just talked with some people you know recently, um, and yeah. I wanted to have you on as the longtime tour manager for Kendall Street Company. Um, so I've gotten to know you a little bit, and I'm just amazed by the work you do. Um, where are you joining us from today? Are you at home? Yes, I am at home uh, getting ready to go out for the weekend, you know. Um, so yeah, I'm back in Charlottesville for right now, though. So, And you had quite a busy last couple of months. You all were on the road all over the place. Um, how did the tour go? It was great, you know, um, routing out to Colorado. We did, you know, St. Louis. We did Indianapolis for the first time, you know, just a bunch of stuff that I haven't really, a bunch of places I haven't really been to yet. Um, mm -hmm. And then going out to Colorado is always amazing. And being with Doom Flamingo and that whole team was phenomenal. So yeah. it was great. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and we got to hear a little bit about that. Um, but I'm, I'm really curious about the work that you do. Um, can you tell us a little bit about, you know, when you started working for Kendall Street, um, you know, and, and kind of what your work entails? Yeah, um, I started working for Kendall Street um, in February 2022. Um, I had met them a little bit before that. I met them, you know, once shows were able to come back and they'd actually played. I booked them at a um, venue that I used to work at. So met them that way. So I've been working with them for a little over two years now. Um, and I kind of wear a lot of different hats, you know, so along with tour management, you know, which is I advance the shows, I make the schedules, I, you know, make all the travel plans, everything like that. But I also do a lot of the merch management, merch design, um, graphic design, and also a lot of the production side of it as well. So lots of stuff. Lots of stuff. So like, is this something that, that you had wanted to do and were kind of looking for the right, you know, fit? Or did you kind of get into this and be like, oh yeah, you know, I really, I really love doing all this stuff. Yeah, I would have never thought this was something I would do. Um, mm -hmm. Again, I was I was the general manager for a bar restaurant venue combination in like the very small town in Virginia that I went to school at, um, and I started doing the talent buying there. And you know, Lewis, the front man of Kendall Street Company, came up to me and was just like, "Hey, if you ever decide you want to leave and tour around with a rock band." Uh, let us know. And, you know, at the time when he had asked me, I was pretty like content where I was. And then I thought about it a little bit more and just, I texted him and was like, Hey, if you guys still need to tour manager, I'd love to be that mm -hmm. for you. So I, this wasn't really anything I was expecting, but I'm very fortunate that it came to me. So yeah, and now like here you are all these shows later all over the country. I mean, it's it's a very unique environment, of course, to to live and work in. Um, what do you what do you love about being on tour? Like what about it speaks to you? Because I know it's not for everybody. Yeah, I mean, I I always say I'm very thankful because I have an amazing group of guys that I go on tour with. Mm -hmm. So that's probably the very first thing is, you know, I met them in a professional setting, but they became some of my best friends like along the way. Um, 
I love just traveling with other, you know, amazing people on the road and just, you know, again, I lived in a pretty small town in uh, mm-hmm. Virginia for a while. So I never would have thought I would be in California or Colorado or anything like that. So it's just given me the chance to like see the world a little bit more, at least, you know, the United States a little bit more. Um, yeah. I just love all the people I meet along the way, really. Yeah. It is, it is cool for that. Cause you know, you're in different places all the time and, and you all doing the driving, which um, was my experience a long, long time ago. Um, I was a van driver and merch person for a band and I loved it. And I would find myself uh, kind of comparing what I thought that life would be like versus what it was. And both are great. I actually really, really enjoyed it. Um, And we'd go out for weeks at a time. But, you know, the one thing that people would kind of assume is like, it's exciting all the time. Like you are 100% on. I'm like, well, there's actually a lot of time either in the van or at a venue where you're kind of just hanging, like waiting for sound check and, I don't know, like, have you, have you felt any kind of surprises along the way of like, oh, this isn't exactly like what you might think it's going to be? Yeah, I mean, it was, it's one of those things where what a bunch of people I've heard along the way, they're always like, oh, yeah, you know, hurry up and wait, you know, so it's like, I can give you a schedule and we can have this schedule, but you're still going to wait like three to four hours before a show happens. Um, for the most part. Um, and, you know, it definitely is like my mom and like my family still have no clue what I do. <laughs> like I try to explain it and they're just like, oh, so you tour with the rock bands. So you must be partying and hanging out all the time. I'm like, no, it's just, it's pretty, you know, nonstop, which is great for me personally, but, um, it's definitely a lot different than I thought it would be. And it's been kind of a learning process throughout that in that mm-hmm. sort of way. So, yeah. Anything like, like in particular that, that comes to mind when you think about that learning process? Like anything that kind of stands out to you? Yeah. I mean, the biggest learning curve for me was just, you know, just being a little bit more confident, you know, in what I was doing and like, allowing myself to be in that space and occupy the space that I was. Um, I, it was a little rough for me at first cause you know, it was just, you know, a different world for me. And so I just was, you know, figuring that out along the way. And I think I finally got into like at least a better place of, you know, appreciating that I am allowed in this space and I deserve to be in this space and, you know, trying to hone in on that a little bit more. So. Well, let's face it, Kevin, no offense. We talk about this sometimes. A lot of dudes, you know, like bottom line. And it makes me make me think of uh, pickles from uh, Frankie and the witch fingers. And she was telling a story about, you know, the four of them will walk into a venue together, the band, and they'll point her to the merch table. Yeah. Instead of realizing that she's the bass player for the band. What kind of challenges do you find being a woman in a male dominated industry? Well, I think the biggest thing, you know, I, the biggest thing that I've faced so far is, you know, you, it's almost every show sometimes where it's, you know, I'm at the merch table or I'm doing all this stuff. And they're like, oh, you're a girlfriend or you're a wife or you're, you know, Mm -hmm. which one are you sleeping with? And, you know, I, there's like one instance that always sticks out to me, like very much where we were playing a show um, and I was at the merch table and a guy comes up and he's like, oh, so you're like just a groupie, right? And he started laughing and I was like, I don't, I don't get it. Like, why do you say that? And, you know, I knew why he said it, but uh, he was like, oh, well, it was a joke. I was like, well, I don't get it. So can you explain it to me? And he just like, you know, kind of tail between his legs at that point, just was like, sorry, like walked away. Um, 
and you know i've had some other instances of outside of you know people thinking i'm with someone in the band um just kind of stuff where people are just shocked that a woman can like know what they know about production and mm-hmm. front of house and it's not everywhere i've had i've worked with like amazing venue staff that has like immediately listen to me upon arrival but you know i also deal with uh people like at one venue we were at being like what does a woman tour manager know about this stuff you know it's oh. it's that's kind of been the biggest challenge and again i can't speak highly enough about the guys that i'm with like they won't allow it if anyone tries to say anything to me say anything about me when i'm not there they will shut it down immediately and be like this is who you're talking to sorry like you're not talking to us you're talking to her which oh yeah so amazing that is fantastic and i you know i'm i'm sorry that you have to deal with that i know by your presence and the work you do just being there is challenging people's assumptions and we had also heard something very similar from becca with solar circuit out of philly um because she does a lot of their post-production stuff um and she had said something very similar about even going to work with some you know other people in the industry and like walking into rooms and just you know kind of summoning that sense of no it's not only is it cool for me to be here like i've earned the right to be here yeah and i can i can more than handle, you know, what I've got in front of me. So I get that. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely, you know, there are amazing like women tour managers who sadly I haven't been able to meet, uh, but I've heard about along the way. Um, And, you know, I kind of just let that drive me a little bit being like, you know, I'm pretty sure, um, Goose's tour manager is Mm -hmm. another woman named Sam. Um, And, you know, there's just so many, like, women now occupying this space. And it's it's been amazing to see. And I hope I get to meet more in this scene and, like, as we progress. So, yeah. Yeah. I think think you would enjoy, um, Kevin, I think it's Maggie Rose's podcast where... Mm. She, at least she used to focus songbird, on songbird, right? Songbird. Thank you. I was like, I know what it is. I can't remember. Um, she would have on um, a lot of great um, women in the industry doing various things. It was, it's a very cool podcast. And, you know, half the time they're really just talking about their experiences, but, you know, as an individual. Um, but I think when you put it all together, it's, it's a very powerful thing. I think we need to have like a jam band like networking group or something but yeah. <laughs> so so can you can you run through typical day on the road like when you wake up what's the first thing you do yeah so i mean typical day on the road for me is basically wake up if we're at a hotel make sure everyone's checked out make sure we're there um remind everyone time and schedule uh I, along with two of the other guys, do the majority of the driving. Um, Mm -hmm. I definitely take on a big load of the driving. So I'll drive us to where we need to go. Um, Once we get to the venue, it's all about, you know, making sure everyone's gathered, unloading, getting everything into the venue. Um, And once we're in there, I'll be the one who sets up our, we use, we have a X32 in-ear monitor rack. Um, so I'll go in immediately, set that up, tell front of house what's going on, um, make sure all the production stuff is squared away first, and then go in, set up merch, and, you know, set up merch, make sure everything in the green room is good. And then once the show starts, get them there on time, print out the set lists, and, or, songless is what we usually use um Mm -hmm. and once the show starts it's pretty much you know i am behind the merch table for most shows Mm -hmm. um taking pictures and 
they don't really do a set list. They do a song list um, mm-hmm. in the kind of same vein of, I guess, you know, like Fish, stuff like that. Um, and, you know, our guitar player, Ben, who y'all spoke to, will be the one who calls all those songs. And so it can be drastically different from the list that I printed. And so I keep track of all of that for them and just keep track of what they play and post everything once it needs to. You have so. a spreadsheet? Um, Not really a spreadsheet. It's just kind of, uh, we started doing the typical thing, like, you know, I take a picture and post everything on Instagram as soon as the show's over. And I kind of just trust my memory to know. I, I think I've done almost 300 shows with these guys in the past. Wow two plus years um that's a lot of shoes yeah yeah I go, I go with them everywhere um and you know we have our february residency which mm-hmm. is you know 20 shows in a month so that's right. like the big chunk of that and you but, don't have to leave virginia. virginia yes that is that february residency i owe a lot to because that was the first tour that i ever went on with them um they're like this is gonna be easy it's gonna be fine it's the same you know the same venue same people like every single week and i always like i always joke with them because they're like it's so easy you're gonna know everything after this um and then the very first show i did with them post that first february tour was at the 9 30 club when they opened for big something and i was like Wait a minute! Like, you, what is happening here right now? So, definitely been a shift. So, yeah. Nine thirty club. <clears throat> love, love the nine thirty club. So many. Fun I love the night. There. I have but stories. It, yeah, yeah. It's that kind of place, you know. <laughs> it's that kind of place. Yeah, we just we just started playing the Atlantis too, which is you know I guess. Mm-hmm. It's the old 930 Club, but that yes. space, amazing. Cannot- it's a cool little pot. My youngest got to, one of my uh, oldest friends works for IMP, and she won the lottery for the Foo Fighters at Atlantis and took my kid with her because my kid's a huge fan. So can you imagine seeing the Foo Fighters in that space? You've been in that space, so you know. <laughs> it's small. I mean, it's not like small, but like, 200 people right like 200 or so i think it might be i think it's a 450 okay it's that big okay right with the upstairs and the rooftop yeah. bar and all right yeah they have like the this nice little balcony with a bar up there and then just kind of the downstairs the downstairs space um yeah we just did a show with neighbor there recently so that was super fun but it's being in those spaces is so crazy. Like somewhere like the nine thirty club, anything like that. Like I never thought that is where my life would have led. <laughs> so were you um, like, were you a, a part of the like jam band scene as a fan? I know you mentioned a venue that you had worked at, but like is, is where you are now with Kendall street, kind of the, the musical community that you've been a part of, or is that also something kind of new for you? Uh, it's definitely something pretty new. Um, I, when I was in high school and early college and stuff, um, you know, I would listen to like Grateful Dead and everything like that, like seen Dead and Company like two or three times. And that was pretty much my realm of anything jam band was listening to the dead and seeing Dead and Company. Um, and I historically was going to, you know, more like DIY kind of like emo punk shows from where I was at. Um, And that's kind of where I was. Um, And working at the venue definitely helped me expand some sort of Mm -hmm. my music. I used to be really jaded. I'd be like, if you're not into this type of music, I don't care what you're into. Um, Fifth wave emo or get out. (laughs) Yeah. It was crazy. I was like, oh my God. Sometimes I look back and I'm like, I closed myself off to 
so many different types of genres and music and mm -hmm. so many talented like bands. Um, and then I started going to these festivals mainly with um, Kendall Street and that's kind of where it opened me up a little bit more to everything. And, you know, now I'm just super into fish and like shit like that. So not shit. That was a bad way. So. No, it's cool though. <laughs> I find a lot of people who get into fish when they're younger don't get into, they don't know this other stuff. I grew up listening to punk and metal mm -hmm. and, and the Grateful Dead parallel i had a parallel thing so i appreciate the diy and the, mm -hmm. the whole oh, thing yeah. yeah and i've always kind of in a weird way had this thought process of like you know i've seen so many different like punk bands and like you know emo bands or diy bands that just jam you know right. and so that was always so nice to hear and see and everything like that. And, you know, it just kind of naturally flowed into me getting more into mm -hmm. jam band music. Um, and really big on jazz now. Charlottesville has a great jazz scene uh, that Kendall Street Company has, you know, shown me. So that's also a little new. Uh, Does tracks exist still down there? Oh, wow. Uh, <laughs> I know side tracks is there. there. There was a place called T R A X. I saw fish there maybe in ninety or ninety one. It was a hole in the wall. It, it was, was Yeah, I got there one or two times for some other shows. But it was one of those legendary places that yeah. you know, you saw the venue name pop up on like a cassette or something. Or like tapes, a, right. It was always on a tape. It was always you know? And you'd be like, Oh sweet, this is gonna be a great one. <laughs> Yeah, I don't think it's still here, unfortunately. Well, if you don't know it, it probably isn't. You probably would know it if it was. You would, yeah, you would know. I totally respect what you're saying, you know, and most people don't believe that, like, Kevin, you know, you had that, like, parallel track. I was listening. I'm from New Jersey, so, like, hip-hop was huge, late 80s, early 90s, mid-90s, but then also, like, Adam Ant and Midnight Oil, and, like, I, I was into so many other things, and... um I almost think this is just kind of off the cuff theory that not being as 100% like immersed in some mm -hmm. of this may actually have set you up to be really, really focused in what you're doing. Because if it were me having to do all that, I'd be like, whoa, you know, it, I wouldn't be able to, I think, keep I my own my stuff way. like separate, you know, yes. did you hear that? I did hear that. That was your hip hop. That was your late '90s hip hop there. But you know, it's like it, it, it has me thinking of John Mayer. You know, John Mayer got into the Grateful Dead listening to studio stuff, and mm -hmm. really late in his life. And he is such a fantastic steward of what Garcia did. And I think part of it was that he was never part of it, almost yeah. coming as an outsider to it later. You know? Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely like. I always kind of say that I'm very fortunate that I started, you know, touring with a band that played music and was in a scene that I wasn't into. Cause you know, right. if I was doing this with a band that I was already into or a scene that I was already into, I would be, I feel like I would either get bored or I would be too like immersed into, it. <laughs> into everything yeah. else. That I wouldn't want to, you know, with this, like, I'm consistently finding new music. I'm consistently seeing mm -hmm. shows that, like, absolutely blow my mind. Uh, and just, like, meeting so many people. And I'm consistently engaged in mm -hmm. keeping, you know, tabs on it at this point, which is insane. Because in college, I had a bunch of friends, too, who were, like, super into fish. And I was like, oh, I'm into the dead. Like, sorry, you know, <laughs> and now it's here and I have my cup and my poster. Like, it's now, now it's now it's goose and fish. Now there'd be the people saying I'm into goose and the yeah. other people, I'm only into fish. Oh, my God. Literally. It's, <laughs> it's so <laughs> insane. <laughs> yeah. I know. I know. I still, I don't think I've, we have 
consistently like played a bunch of festivals that Goose was headlining. Um, and I still have not even gotten a chance to see them. <laughs> so oh, yeah. just like so busy and like doing stuff that's like hard to see in Delaware. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, so so can you tell me how the Guar thing happened? Because we really didn't get the whole story from them. Fascinating stuff. Oh, oh my goodness. Um, <laughs> yeah, so we have a member of our team who's kind of, you know, off, off there. Um, who, you know, Guar is from Richmond. Like, uh, I think one or two members went to UVA uh, here in Charlottesville. And so, you know, he knew them really well and everything like that. And so we just asked, really, like, I, I started kind of in the beginning introducing into the band van when I drove, like, more metal or punk or anything like that. And that's kind of, I think, where, you know, some of that heavier influence that they've recently you taken to see yeah i'm like you know here you go like and so then our guitar player ben he he just asked he was like do you want to sit in with us do you want to do this um and he was like sure why not i'm free i'm in richmond and that was probably the craziest night ever <laughs> like he got ready, I think, like a block away, not even. Um, and because the green rooms at the Broadberry aren't huge. So aren't green rooms. <laughs> just, you know, they're like a little space and it's fun and nice, uh, but not <laughs> enough for someone to get into this big theatrical costume. Um, yeah. and, and so I had to, I went and went a block away, grabbed him from where he got ready and then walked back on the, in the streets of Richmond, just on a Friday night, like with this giant, like guy. (laughs) And it was so sweet. Um, But yeah, it was mainly a connection because we share this mutual friend and it Mm -hmm. just, he was like, we're not on tour. Like, I'm not doing anything. I live right there. I'm right there. So, wow. sure, sounds fun. <laughs> so, it was crazy. That was the biggest sit-in that I think we've, I guess. Landed so far. Yeah. So far. Yeah, we've had some fun ones. But that one was crazy. <laughs> so, you got, you got to get you a John Mayer out there. <laughs> Maybe, maybe one of these days. We'll we'll see if John. To Althea, everyone knows Althea. Yeah, <laughs> John wants to come on one of these days. So. Well, you're, you're, you mentioned you know you have contacts and all. I would imagine that you know over that many shows and and all the traveling you do, your personal connections, you know, in in the industry, have to be just like growing and growing all the time, like in a long-term sense, um, like, do you see yourself like staying in, maybe not on the road as much, or do you, like, do you think that's something that you really want to continue doing for, for a long time? Yeah. I mean, as of right now, I, I love being on the road, but I say that as, you know, a 26 year old. So, you know, I love being on the road. I love, traveling i i've always been kind of a busy body and so you know being able to travel and be Mm -hmm. consistently busy is amazing to me um so for right now i think that's kind of where i'm set and where i'm at but you know things can always change sometimes so i do foresee me wanting to work like in the music industry for a long time though i think that there's this has been where I've found, you know, it sounds corny or whatever. It's like where I found myself, you know, like these, these people that I work with, you know, like the band and Irwin, our manager, CJ, our agent, you know, they uplift me and so much 
and I'm so gracious for it. So, you know, yeah. it's, that's kind of where I'm at right now is I love touring and I love being on the road. So that's awesome. When your yeah. core group, you know, like you said, it's the band, but then it's also, you know, other people around you are so supportive and have so much respect for what you do. It makes it a lot easier um, for just all the other logistical things, you know, that are going on. And um, I know that like as an industry needs more people out there like you who are on top of their shit, you know, and, and also really like being out there too. Cause it's, it's not always easy, but it is really awesome. And it's something you can't really duplicate doing many other things. Where do you, where do you see the industry in five years? Oh, that's a hard one. I mean, the top thing that comes to my mind is I hope that, you know, more women are occupying this space, like not in any negative way, of course. Mm -hmm. I've, but, you know, I think that there's definitely always room to grow and room to, you know, welcome other people in these spaces. Um, and, you know, that's kind of my hope in five years is that we start seeing those voices amplified and everything. Maybe reflecting society more, 50 50, half women, you know? Yeah, yeah. It's definitely like, you know, just reflecting in, you know, growth and more. I don't know. It's, it's hard. I am hoping that it keeps growing with the world around it and that it doesn't falter at all. So I know a lot of people with, you know, streaming and AI and everything like that, it's definitely a little unknown sometimes. So I don't know. I think we I need think to encourage the, the young ladies in high school that they can pick up a guitar or they can get behind the soundboard or yeah. something, you know, we need to encourage. Yeah. And I think a lot of it, that's maybe what it boils down to you know like my kid wanted to play child the stand-up bass and mm -hmm. they handed her a clarinet <laughs> you know <laughs> yeah i mean it's kind of like i wanted to play guitar at first like and you know i when i was growing up i was really like i want to play guitar um and then eventually they were like well i think you should like play bass instead and i'm like Okay, like, and I love playing bass. I think there's, like, I mean, it sounds cheesy, but Kim Gordon is, has been my fucking idol for love years and years and so long. Like, um, but there is, like, I have heard that kind of stereotype where people are like, oh, if a band wants to seem like they're inclusive, they put a girl on bass, you know? And the Tina Weymouth model. It's the Tina Weymouth model. <laughs> and I mean, and I think we just have so many people breaking out that like I love seeing Karina Reichman, like and mm -hmm. seeing her with how like you know, she's just I've seen her a couple times. I saw her at Peach mm -hmm. last and she was just phenomenal. So it's mm -hmm. like, you know, just welcoming everyone into that space is just so important, you know. But also, I did play clarinet as well. So, right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I get that. Well, you know, Kevin, you mentioned the high school thing. Um, I think there's a lot to that in the sense that, you know, just even bringing somebody into that kind of space, it just immediately makes it seem like, okay, there's possibilities for things, you know, and um, that's something that's, I think, really hard to come by sometimes, depending on where someone lives or, you know, what they have access to. So you being all around and, you know, just being present, I think, is like a just a huge thing, like even, you know, just doing that. Yeah, thank you. It's it's definitely nice. It's been very nice to be able to like, you know, we still play like frat shows sometimes. Right. We'll play these college parties and you know, I've had other, you know, young women come up to me and be like, how did you do this? How are you, how are you doing this right now? And it's just like, you know, I'm very thankful because I was kind of right place, right time and met the group that I did. But, you know, it's 
pretty, pretty nice. So it's like, you know, just get involved with your local scene and your venues and just kind of put yourself out there, which is definitely hard. It's, it's a little hard, but yeah. we always my, get there. My ex-wife, we uh, met Jane Monheit, the keyboardist uh, singer once. And, uh, Amanda said she was an Amanda. Um, she said, uh, "What can you give me any advice?" And she said, "No more than the boys." That was her advice to Amanda for the industry: to no more than the boys. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> oh God! All right, so I do have a question. Just kind of thinking about what you had mentioned of your your background and musical taste before this whole adventure started. In all honesty. Do you ever look out at a crowd dancing at a show and you're like, what is going on here? Or is it a similar vibe in some ways to like, just because I've been immersed in this for so long, it's impossible for me to have any kind of like objective opinion about it. (laughs) But I was just curious. Well, I mean, it definitely, you know, the first couple months I was doing this, I was like, what is happening right now? (laughs) You know, um, But, you know, after I had been immersed into it a little bit, I was like, Mm -hmm. this is so much fun, you know? Like, I was going to shows before and was just, like, standing in the back or something. Like, I was Mm -hmm. just, like, arms crossed, like, stuff like that. And uh, then it took, I think, my first fish show that I saw where I was like, oh, like, you can, like, dance and, like, have a good time. And it's Mm -hmm. like so cool like just being able to see everyone be so free and like not worried about it was definitely the biggest kind of thing for me and it can be tough getting outside of your head to dance i remember the first time i danced at uh this band the jello boys they were on an apple orchard on top of a mountain and i was doing the same thing just standing there and by the end of shakedown street my arms were flailing around and I had made that breakthrough that it was okay. No one cares. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, as long as you're not like, you know, being disrespectful to people's space, like they're fine. Like you, you're not going to embarrass yourself, which is like great. Um, you may become a hero. <laughs> yeah. It definitely, it did take a little bit at first to like kind of break out my shell in that way, just because mm-hmm. I'm outside of the road. I am typically a pretty reserved person and so the thought of like being out there and dancing Mm -hmm. and doing anything like that a show is crazy to think about but we've slowly but surely gotten there so you want to sell us some kendall street company stuff before we get to the end um yeah i mean you know first and foremost so thankful for those guys they i'm might come off as a little biased, but you know, they're just such an amazing group of guys that have welcomed me and every other person like into their group and has uplifted me and others. And they're just so caring and amazing. Um, I, once again, I always say that I'm, I truly won the lottery with a group to tour manage. Um, and outside of that, you know, um, I don't know when this is airing, but we're about to leave for our little Baltimore trip. Uh, We're in Baltimore and Asbury Park. I love being there. My weird little man, Tilly, uh, is there. And New York. Um, Outside of that, we have some festivals coming up. Um, We just announced the Homie Collective camp out. Uh, We're going to be at Northlands. And yeah, got a lot of fun. And you got some studio stuff cooking too, huh? Yeah, lots of stuff. Yeah, we're, the guys are releasing a single every final Friday of the month for the whole year. Um, That's smart, smart move. I love it. Yeah, I mean, we might see some uh, interesting collaborations from that, which... Mm. I'll keep on the DL for right now, but <laughs> I, I, um, I, I will tell you this, that song lost together should mm-hmm. have been a hit. I don't know why like college radio didn't pick it up. It really, it was such a strong song and the, the performance of it really followed through. 
yeah, that song, yeah, I I agree. I feel like it didn't get what it deserved, but you know, it's it was always great. Um, that was a song that they had actually wrote. It was supposed to be on their first EP or their first studio release, one of the two, um, back in like 20, between 2014, 2016. And they ended up cutting it and then they just kind of brought it back. It. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's, it's always so beautiful to see. I know so many people who are just in love with it and, you know, it's, it's just one of those things. So, but we have a lot of other, you know, weird funk, harder jams coming up. Yeah, they told us metal when we talked to them the other day, they said, look for some metal -y yeah. stuff. Okay. Yeah. 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 They are definitely, uh, bebopping all over the place when it comes to genres, which is always, and that's what always keeps it fun. You know, mm -hmm. it's, everyone always asks me like, why do you like, how do you not get bored of this? And I'm like, because I've never seen the same set twice from these guys. Like, right. I've, I've seen some similar ones, but never the same. And the jams always go somewhere else. It's, it's truly phenomenal to watch such a talented group of guys and be able to like be with them every day. Yeah. So I will say the live experience at one of their shows is so high energy you know there's going to be some fun surprises of some kind I mean I just feel like they have really cultivated that sense of like okay you're here you're in on like the fun with us kind of thing yeah. it's it's really great and so I definitely could see where from your perspective you you definitely feel that way because it always is something I think a little bit different and I love how open they are to exploring all these different ways of making their art you know it's it's a really very like honest approach to things i don't know it's it's really cool yeah like being able to just watch certain things and jams just evolve and be there is just so magical sometimes like some mm -hmm. of the songs that they like i've been seeing them perform some of these songs for the first time like becca's mm -hmm. dad um I was, you know, in the green room with them when Lewis was just kind of like strumming it and like coming up with that basic idea and just seeing like where it's transcended to at this point. And it's the same for a lot of these songs where it's always nice to like hear and be there and see mm -hmm. that idea and watching that song and everything and just grow with it. So it's very mm -hmm. nice. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Um, I know that we'll be, you know, putting out the the chat that we did the other day, but I was really happy that we had a chance to talk. So thank you for, for doing this. I, I may put them out both, try to put you and them out in the same week, and we can do the Kendall Street That'd Combo so cool. Week. Or... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Seriously, thank you guys for having me. This is my first uh, podcast appearance I've done as oh, nice. tour manager. Oh, you. So. Well, here's the many more for you. I was going to say, um, it won't be your last, I guarantee it. All right, let me stop this. If you are enjoying All That Jam, please like and subscribe to our social media channels at All That Jam Pod on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, or visit our website, allthatjampod.com. Make sure to sign up for our email list and tune in every week for new episodes. Also, look for full interviews on our YouTube channel. And remember, stay beautiful, but don't stay underground too long.